um, gracias por venir, antes de nada. Voy a presentaros a estos dos caballeros que, tenemos, que tengo a mis lados. Voy a presentarles en inglés, ninguno de los dos habla nada de español, creo que saben pedir cerveza y poco más. Eh, um, todos los que queráis tenéis cascos para escucharlo en español y los que lo entendáis en inglés, pues mejor sin cascos. Al final del todo vamos a hacer una ronda de preguntas, así que preparaos todas las preguntas que tengáis y os las guardáis para el final, os las apuntáis, que no se os olvide. Y, um, y nada, lo dicho, gracias por venir. So, this is Bob Allen and this is Michael Garren. Thank you guys for coming. Please, aplaudimos. They are going to talk about robots and they're going to talk about what they do in Silicon Valley. They are living in Silicon Valley. We all want to live there at some point. I was like this height and I wanted to live there. So now I still want to live there. I cannot live there. So I like bringing people from Silicon Valley and just talking to them and try to live their dream and so on, you know? So thank you guys. I'll let you start. Okay. All yours. Uh, how about how about this one? I prefer this one because I don't want to have to hold this. No, no, no. I, I want want that one. Yeah. No. Yeah. We'll get it. <laughs> no, no. Hello, hello. Does that one work? <laughs> Get another one? Yes? See? Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me now with this one? I'll kind of get started with this one. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll start again. I, um, <clears throat> it, it's a pleasure being here at the campus party. Uh, this is a really cool event, and uh, it's an honor to be able to present uh, some of the robots that we have, like Angel said, from Silicon Valley. But I really want to thank a couple of people that were instrumental in getting uh, us here, and that's uh, uh, Claudia who help with all the travel and, and uh, organization and paperwork, and uh, uh, Isabel, which just organization, and Pepe, I think he's in the back maybe, um, that uh, is part of the organization on the robotic side, as well as Angel. Um, he does a terrific job both here in Spain and in California, in Silicon Valley, of networking, bringing people together. So I really appreciate all the, the work that they've done to get us here. So what I'll do is we're going to go through a few robots and um, um, kind of give some demos and give some slides. And uh, at the end, I'll, we'll be able to take some questions. And I hope we have some really good questions that we'll try to answer. Um, I've kind of got a se severe jet lag with no sleep because campus party goes like 24 hours. <laughs> and I haven't been getting to bed until 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning. So um, I apologize if I kind of stumble along every once in a while. Um, I also want to thank my friend Michael, who came. Actually, he's not from Silicon Valley. Um, but I've been a friend for him for about 20 years. 
And uh, he came down from England to kind of help out. So I uh, really appreciate that. One of the things that's important is the networking thing. And here at, at um, Campus Party, everybody kind of networks. Well, in the United States, we have clubs. And I belong to a homebrew robotics club. And we meet every month. We get together. We usually have some formal presentation. And then afterwards, we have um, kind of what we call show and tell. And this is kind of what we did. I know there were a few people last night that kind of joined in. It was late and about 11, 11.30, and just kind of talked about their robots. Um, and actually, that's how I met everybody from Spain. Uh, there was a gentleman, and I'm not sure if he's here yet, uh, by the name of Alejandro. Uh, he came over four or five years ago, and he brought uh, this really cool hexapod. And it just so happened he was in town when we were having a robot club meeting. So we went to the club meeting, and he presented his robot, which was really cool. Well, Alejandro and I, over the last four or five years, have kept in touch via email. And then um, Angel came along. He was in college, knew Alejandro. And um, Angel came out to San Francisco and got in contact with us. And we brought him in and showed him all the different robots that we had. And then he got all excited about it. I mean, he, he gets excited about a lot of things, but robots is really cool. Um, and then he um, came back to RoboGames, which is a competition that we have every year in San Francisco. And he brought some robots and competed. And I, get to, I got to uh, know him a little bit better, which was really cool. He's, he's a great guy. But, but it's that networking thing. And that's what kind of brought my business partner, Ted, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Somebody had to run the company. Um, he's the co-founder, as well as I am, of Ologic. And that's kind of how Ted and I actually started as well. It was at a club meeting. And Ted came to me and was introduced by the president of the club. <clears throat> and uh, he said, yeah, Bob. He said, uh, I understand you have like a machine shop and build robots. He said, I want to build a robot that can roam around my house. And I said, OK. I said, well, what kind of parts do you have? And he looked at me and he said, well, I got these huge motors and these big wheels. And I said, where'd you get these? He said, well, off of eBay. He said, they're kind of BattleBot parts. I said, whoa. I said, BattleBot parts? And you want this to go around your house? I said, it'll destroy your house. I said, what you need to do is build a little smaller robot. And I was really curious about two-wheel balancing robots at that time. So I said, why don't we build a two-wheel balancing robot. And he said, well, how do we do that? I said, I don't know. Let's start. Well, seven months later, um, we might go move this and we'll give a little demo. Seven months later, we had our first balancing robot. And let me tell you, it was pretty exciting. It was two in the morning. And all it did is just sit there and balance. And we just pushed it between each other. And it, and it was really, really cool. This was probably 2003. And there wasn't a lot of balancing robots at the time. So this is what developed from that kind of conversation. This robot's called Flexo. And what we're going to do, we're going to do a couple of really quick demos. Um, he's just balancing. He also has a camera that follows the color red. And we have the camera turned off. Because what we're going to do is, this is a demo. Michael, won't you move it more in the middle? So that way, if he takes off, um, is I always kind of ask people, what do you think happens? Yeah, I just reset him. What do you think happens if I take the table when he's balancing and I start lifting the table up? And everybody says, well, he's going to fall over. Well, why? Well, because he balances. He'll fall over. And everybody thinks a two wheel balancing robot is very easy to knock over, when in fact they're not. I can take my finger and push down. I mean, I'm pushing down with him pretty good force. You see how he tilts back a little bit? He's pushing back up, so he's not going to fall over. So I said, well, okay, well, let's see what happens. So we're going to get him here. He's kind of wandering around. We're going to reset him, make sure he doesn't go off the table. And um, so I'm going to gradually lift the table up here, and we'll see what happens. At some point, just because of the amount of torque and all, 
he'll, he won't be able to go up the incline, incline. But if we had a really lots of motors, heavy duty, and there, there he was. So it, they're really cool and they're really flexible on how they do that. Now we're going to move the table. And uh, we're going to put the camera on. And uh, this is, this is uh, Michael, you notice he has a, a red t-shirt on. And uh, the camera follows the color red. And we got pretty good lighting here, so if Flexo, the robot, and Michael get together, it takes a while for him to uh, kind of get the camera going. And you'll see in a minute here, just scoot down a little bit, Michael, give him, give him a, you know, robots are temperamental. <laughs> um, there we go. Yeah, there you go. You got to get his attention. And now he's going to follow wherever Michael goes. He'll follow Michael around. As long as Michael doesn't fall off the stage. Of course, you know, the robot's going to fall off the stage too. <laughs> So it's a, it's a really interesting problem to be able to balance, have the camera moving, and then turn the robot around. Um, and so we kind of said, wow, this is really cool. And we got some companies. and We hadn't started the company at that point. Um, and um, we decided that maybe there's a business here. And um, we've had a couple of toy companies that are interested in this. And unfortunately, I wanted to bring one, but the toy company wouldn't allow it because it's not really out yet. Um, but um, hopefully in the next couple of years, uh, it'll be out in the market. So that's kind of what got us started. And, and that all came from a robotics club that's similar to um, the robot party. Cool, Michael. Okay. So, I'm going to talk a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so, that then, uh, Ted and I got together, and we said, well, that was fun to build. Let's, let's build some more robots. So, um, we started off um, building another, whoops, sorry. Pushed the wrong button there. I knew I was going to do that. Um, so we came up with uh, many concepts and, and many robots. We use um, a CAD program called SolidWorks, which probably a lot of people are familiar with that, and we do a CAD drawing of each of our robots before we kind of build them. And then we actually build them in a miracle that they actually look like the CAD drawings. Um, but this robot is called Follow Me. And we'll be talking about him a little bit later, and I got a video of him, but he's a really cool robot. But then this guy down here, he, his name is Fat Albert, and it's a two-wheel balancing robot. And everybody says, well, <clears throat> a two-wheel balancing robot's great until it falls down. Then what do you do? Well, Ted and I looked at that as a, t a challenge, and we said, if it falls down, it should get back up. So we worked on that for a while, and that's what uh, Fat Albert does here. If he falls down, he, f he falls on his back in the backside. Whoops, oh, darn it. I need a robot to help me out here. Um, he falls in the backside, and there's this bar that comes and raises him back up, and he starts balancing again. So we thought, hmm, that's kind of clever. Well, we got a patent on that. So that was kind of cool. So then we said, well, oh, darn it. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, let's build uh, a robot called Igor, which is our indoor positioning robot. And I'm going to talk more in detail about him. And then over the years, we, we came across the company that had this really cool, it was called a ribbon lift. And if you notice in this robot right here, it looks like there's a neck. Well, this neck can go up about, and, and I'm not really good with meters, but about 10 to 15 meters. So that's about 30 feet in the air. And, it, and it's, it's three ribbons that come together to make a pole that raises this camera or whatever uh, up real high. And that's good that if you wanted to look over a fence or in a building. So it's like a security robot. 
Um, then we also built this robot, which is a mind control robot. And we put on this headset, and we can, with our thoughts, with our EEG waves, we can get the robot to kind of go forward and backwards. And that, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end, is developed into a Star Wars toy called the Force Trainer. Then we have a robot up here called Odyssey. And Odyssey is an outdoor robot. And it's for a competition in the States we call Robo Magellan. And Robo Magellan is out in the field, um, a park-like setting. Um, and so your robot has to really look at um, some uh, real life things. And, and I'll show a video of him and explain to him a little bit more what, how he does that. Well, there's the video. Finally got to it. So here's Odyssey, and it's taken off. And, and he's, he's looking for an orange cone out in the park. Now, problem without being in the public area is you get people walking by, you get kids, you get dogs. So your robot has to sense its surroundings. And it's, it's kind of hard to kind of figure out what everything is going to be out there. One day, we got the course all set up at RoboGames, and about halfway through, people started coming and putting these rows of white chairs right in the middle of our course. Well, what's that about? Well, we didn't realize that somebody booked a wedding in the park, and we had put our, our um, course right in the middle of that wedding. So here you can see <coughs> he's going along in the grass, and he uses a GPS to navigate just like your car, and we have waypoints. And he goes from one waypoint to another to correct his course, and you can see kind of everybody's kind of cool following him. Look at that, the robot can kind of control all the people. He, he stops, the people stop. Uh, so the robot's going along, and he's, he just did a little um, correction to his waypoint. And, uh, you know, here again we've got um, out in the park-like setting, and you'll see here in a minute, he'll be coming up, and um, there was these um, flowers that were just planted in this flower bed, and they're very delicate flowers. And we hadn't tested Odyssey uh, very well, and um, we were kind of concerned that once it got to this flower bed, and you'll see here in, in just a second, um, kind of what happens. And so Ted and I were very close to the robot right behind it, ready to turn it off because there's the flower bed. And we thought, oh my gosh, it's going to go through the flower bed and wreck the flowers. But with our ultrasonics, it detected the flowers and actually is going around the flower um, uh, plants. And you can see he's kind of going a little bit off. And then he's kind of come back. What he's trying to do, he's trying to get back onto his course that we told him but he ran into his flower bed, so he's going around the flower bed, and then he's going to go back and get on, the, on his course. And he went around the flower bed just perfect. So Ted and I were really pleased with that, that we didn't wreck all the, all the flowers. Now here's Odyssey. He's kind of continuing on, and the first part of this video was the beginning. And now there he's stopped, and he's taken another GPS reading and another heading, and kind of doing some corrections. And one of the things, because you're outdoors, you don't know what the terrain's going to be. And a lot of times, here in the grass, you can see the grass is a little higher, a little lower. But up in Seattle, where it rains a lot, where we did our first competition, the grass was really high. And there were a lot of robots there that couldn't navigate through the grass. So when you kind of building robots, you kind of have to look at, you know, what in real world um, uh, things are I going to come up with. And, and here's another one. This is uh, coming up <clears throat> just to the left was a bronze statue. And we thought, uh-oh, he's going to run into the bronze statue. But again, the ultrasonic said nope. And he went around them. And he's uh, going to continue. Now, he's looking for the cone. And the cone is about, let's see, 300 feet. So that's about 100 meters away. And from the start to the end, it took him about two, two minutes to complete that. Now, he's, he's, he's close to the cone, 
And then when he gets close, what we do is we, we put the camera on. He has a camera that now is looking for the uh, orange cone. And you'll see just now, you see the orange cone. He sees it with his camera, and he has these feelers. And he'll go up and actually touch the cone. And that's part of the competition. And you actually physically have to touch the cone. Now, during, during that, there might be three other cones in between the start cone and the finish cone. And you get extra points if you can go to those uh, middle cones. So you have to touch the cone and back up and start again. So that's Odyssey. That's kind of a, a cool outdoor robot. So I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about um, two more robots. And that's uh, Isis here, which is a Trinity firefighting robot, which is the one we have up here. And then I'm going to talk about Igor, which is our indoor positioning robot, which is kind of cool because you like to know where you're at when you're indoors, and that's hard to do. With Odyssey, we used just a regular GPS that we could buy. But for indoors, we couldn't do that, so we had to come up with something. And then at the end, we're going to get Angel up here, and he's going to demonstrate the Star Wars Force Trainer, which is our mind control toy to be able to levitate the ball. So what is the Trinity Firefighting Contest? That contest started about 1995. So it's been around a while, and it's developed, and it's, it's got a huge following. I got interested in it about that time, and it's a huge challenge. And the idea is you have, here's kind of the layout of the house. It's just a quick picture. But you have this distance and this distance, distance is about 248 centimeters, which in our terms is about 8 feet square. And inside there, you have four rooms. So here's a room, here's a room. You can see a partial room here and a partial room there. And the competition is that before you start, you pick a number from 1 to 4, and that determines where the candle, which is a simulated fire in a house, is going to get put. And then the next number you pick is where in the room is the candle going to be placed. So inside the room here, it could be back in this corner, this corner. It could be along the wall. It could be over in this corner inside or out in the middle. So your robot has to really kind of look at, you know, where, where is the candle going to be. So it's randomly placed. And your robot has to be fully autonomous. In other words, once it starts looking for the candle, you can't touch it. So it's all autonomous. And it's a really fun um, um, competition to do. It's, it's, in a way, it's easy. In a way, it's hard. And we'll talk a little bit more about the details of what makes that up. And your scoring is based from the time you start to the time you put the candle out. And you get three runs to do that. And each time, the it's a, it could be a different room, and the candle could be in a different location in that room. So you have to put the candle out all three times, so your robot has to be really consistent because it's a total score of all three of your runs. So what makes up, how do you build a firefighting robot? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to read the rules. And... I'm an engineer, I don't read directions and don't read rules very well. But I find out as soon as I read the rules that the maximum size my robot can be is 31 centimeters square or round and 27 centimeters high. Well, we don't want to build a robot that's 40 centimeters because then it wouldn't qualify. So it's really important to go through the rules because you'll find that there might be other things, you know, um, what type of, in this case, what type of uh, uh, item that you can use to put the candle out. So it's important to go through the rules and understand the rules. But it's, th th this robot has lots and lots of sensors. And so it really gives you an introduction to using lots of different types of sensors. And we're going to talk about each one of these, but here's just kind of a breakdown. We have sound activation, wall following sensors, bumper sensors, white line detector, flame detector, pyro detector, some way to put the flame out, 
Then we have motors and encoders, and of course we have some kind of controller, microprocessor, and software. Well, that's a, that's a heck of a lot. But if we break it down um, and look at them individually, it's not too bad. So let's look at the first one. This is the, 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 the sound activation. Now, this isn't a requirement. It just allows you to have what we call a multiplier. In this case, it's a 0.95 multiplier. <clears throat> and what this simulates, the buzzer, which is just this, that's about 3.5 kilohertz. And that's the fire alarm going off in your home. So as soon as the fire alarm goes off, the robot starts. And um, on the other side, so this, that the buzzer is really easy. It's just a buzzer, a 9-volt battery, and a switch. And some, as Michael kidded me the other day, uh, I got black tape around it. But then on the robot side, on this side, the robot, we've got a little microphone, an amplifier, and a tone detector. And that tone detector is there to detect the 3.5 kilohertz. So we get a little pulse. Next sensor is going to be, how do we get around, how do we navigate through the house? The easiest way to do that when you get started is to do wall following. So you follow the walls into the different rooms. Um, and wall following is, is an interesting problem all on, on its own. And there are different types of sensors that you can use for wall, so wall following. In this case... <sighs> Keep pushing the wrong button. Let me get back to it. Okay. In this case, uh, I've used uh, an IR, which is an infrared sensor, and it has a range of about 10 centimeters to 80 centimeters. It returns an analog voltage to distance. The problem with that is you have then to have an A to D on your microprocessor, and um, the analog voltage to the distance isn't linear. It's kind of goes up as closer or farther away. So you have to kind of deal with that either to linearize that, that uh, analog voltage or make a table. And the bad thing about it is it's affected by bright sunlight. And you think, well, wh why is that a problem if we're going indoors? Well, again, real world application. It's just yesterday, Angel and I were sitting in the back I don't know, it was 4 or 5 o'clock, and all of a sudden, this big so uh, uh, bright spot of sunlight came right into my eyes. And I've had that happen as well in competition where all of a sudden, it was late in the afternoon, there was maybe a skylight or something, and the sun came through and messed up my infrared detector. So it was really hard for the robot to do its wall following. So then I... Oh, this is, this is, okay, because it's infrared, it's hard to adjust. Well, you see this bright light? It's kind of hard to see. This light here, that's the actual infrared detector bouncing off the walls, and there's the front one. And the way we can look at that and test it is I thought, well, I got my video camera, and it has this night mode. And the night mode detects the infrared. So I got my uh, video camera out, and I use it then to go ahead and adjust the sensors so I can position them exactly the way I want. So using a video camera to help build your robot, it worked out pretty good. So the next sensor is an ultrasonic sensor. And I found that I started using it, and, and Michael as well, um, earlier in last year's competition. And it really worked out really well, and for a couple of reasons. The interface is I squared C. So, well, you got to deal with the I squared C. Depending on what software package you're using, whether it's a C or assembly or maybe a, um, a, a PIC basic, if you're using a, pace, uh, a PIC, um, can be a problem I and mean, can't. So, once you get the I squared C bus running, then you can hook lots of them and like we have on um, ISIS here, there's actually three in the front and one in the back. And they're all off the I squared C bus. Their range is about three centimeters to six meters. Well, 
we don't need six meters because our wall following is fairly short. And the problem with doing six meters is because it takes time for the ultrasonic to go out and then come back. And that could be like 100 plus milliseconds. So as you're wall following, you have to wait then 100 milliseconds for the signal, the ultrasonic, to come back. And that help, that, that'll slow your robot down. Well, this sensor allows you to reconfigure that to bring the six, uh, six meters down to maybe 10 or 12 centimeters, whatever you want. And you can shorten that time up um, maybe to, instead of 100 milliseconds, maybe to 10 or 15 milliseconds. So now I can start wall following a lot faster. And that's, you'll see later why that, that is important. The other thing is they emit a 45 degree beam angle. So you have to kind of be aware of that because it will detect the edge on the floor of the firehouse. Um, so we like to take and just tilt that up about 10 degrees, so it's kind of pointed up a little bit. And then it returns uh, basically three units, in microseconds, how long it took the pulse to go in and out, or in millimeters or in inches. So it's a really flexible um, uh, device to use for your wall following. So let's look at positioning the wall following sensor. You might think, well, let's, here's a robot, here's two wheels, here's a wall, and right here is where my ultrasonic is, or your IR. So this is, say, the beam pattern. So if we put it right here in the center of the wheels, you think, well, that, that'd be the best place. Well, it is a good place, but it present some problems in trying to get what we call fishtailing, where the robot will do this. And we use a PID routine, and that's kind of the help. Uh, a good, good uh, example of a PID routine is your cruise control on your car. Um, you set it at, say, 60 miles an hour, and the car stays at 60 miles an hour, no matter if it's going uphill or downhill. Well, that's what a PID routine does. So a PID routine, say if we wanted to keep this five centimeters from the wall, the PID routine would help keep that five centimeters from the wall. But the problem is it's, it's hard to tune your PID because it, it's right in the center of the wheels. So if we look at the next slide, if we just take and move that ultrasonic up here, just in front of the robot, we get a lot of le uh, less fishtailing and it's a lot easier to tune your PID. And you'll see later when she actually runs in the house how well that runs. So you have to kind of look at that as well. There's one other important sensor that's more of a mechanical sensor, and that's the bump sensor, which is uh, this one here. I've got too many things in my hand, but you can see it goes all the way around the robot. And Trying to come up with a clever bump sensor is important. And you say, well, okay, why do I need a bump sensor? Well, in the firehouse, you will maybe, your robot make a mistake and it will run into a wall. If it runs into the wall and gets stuck, then you're not going to be able to find the candle or find the room that the candle's in. You don't get any points taken off if you just bump the wall. You get points taken off, though, if you slide along the wall. So by putting in a bump sensor, uh, and let me tell you, a bump sensor has saved my robot several times, is a good thing. So I came up with a design, and, and it's hard, hard to see in this slide, but here's the main printed circuit board, which sits right on the top of the robot. And there's the little plastic ring that goes all the way around. And actually, this one's the big ring here. And Hopefully everybody can see. And it's, and it's suspended by springs. So if I hit something, it moves just slightly. Inside that ring is a brass, another brass ring that's mounted to the outside. And that makes up both of our ends of our switch. 
So we've got a contact inside here, and then we have metal posts coming down, just standoffs. And when those two um, connect, that's like a switch. So it makes for a really clean and simple, no wires, no, I've used micro switches and all these other switches and they break and have all kinds of problems. And this really helped that. Here's a, a kind of a top view looking down of the robot and here's the printed circuit board and here's the springs that are um, suspended and the, um, the post. So we have a front sensor, bump sensor, and a right sensor, and a back sensor, and a left. Now we can put four more on the angles. I designed it that way because I thought, well, maybe I might need that for when I, the robot bumps in at a 45 degree. Well, I realized that I really didn't need these, so I took them out because if I hit here, this switch gets activated and this switch gets activated. So I know then I kind of bumped it at 45 degrees and the robot can go ahead and, and um, take its action to correct that. The, the wiring of it um, is pretty simple. So if we look at a typical switch, this is, would be a typical switch like a push button, and we've replaced the push button, this area down here, which is the ground, we've replaced with that ring that goes on inside. And there's just one little wire that runs up and connects to the printed circuit board. This is the post that comes down. And that, therefore, makes your switch. So I wire it to a, uh, an 8-bit port, but I'm only really using the first four bits. Um, and so when I read this port, I can read exactly if, if, if none of these are high, then I know the switch hasn't been activated. If I know um, this one is high and this one is high, uh, switch one and four, then I know exactly if I go back one. If, if I know that uh, the right sensor and the front sensor get activated, like I said before, I know I'm at a 45. If I just get the right sensor, um, then I know I'm at this side and I, again, can take kind of uh, an action to correct that. So that's kind of the, uh, the basic, simplest bump sensor that you can make. Grab some water here. Okay, th so the next sensor is a white line sensor, what we call. And actually it's just a this is an IR and a receiver, and it's just at 45, and it bounces off the ground, off the, off the floor, and it detects when we come across the white line. And we need to know that for a couple of reasons. We need to know that we've gone in, we found the room, because each room, you'll see in a minute, has a white line at the entrance to it. Um, you'll also need to, and when we sh give the demo, you'll see, that the candle sits on a half circle or a quarter circle. And you need to know that you've actually gotten to the candle to be able to put it out. Uh, it's a simple one to do. It's just high-low, so it just takes one bit. But there's one issue that kind of gets me every once in a while. And it's, it's a timing thing. Um, if you've got your loop, and uh, you're doing wall uh, following, and then maybe you look at your bump sensors while you're moving through the house, and then you've got to detect to see if you actually got to the room. If you look at that white line sensor right at the end, and you're, say, just within a hmm, quarter inch would be how many centimeters? <laughs> Small amount. Six millimeters. Um, by the time it goes through that loop, checks the 100 milliseconds, and that's why you don't want 100 milliseconds, and goes down and checks the bump sensor, you might miss the line. Well, that happens maybe once out of 40 times. So when you're programming, you kind of have to look at that. And those are the things that you may not think about when you're actually designing your robot. So now we've been able to start. We may be able to go around the house through the walls and we were able now to find a room. Now we need to look at is the candle in the room? And we use 
what is called a UV-tron. It's made by Hanamatsu, a, a German company, and it consists of a, a board, a control board, and this little sensor right here that detects UV radiation. And it detects it in about 185 to 260 nanometer range. Well, it makes it really sensitive. We can be five meters away from a, a match in a room that has a bright sunlight, and it'll detect within a half a second that the match has been lit. So that's how we determine uh, whether or not the candle's in the room. Well, because it's so sensitive, we run into some problems of false positives. Every once in a while, we get the UV energy that will bounce off a wall and be a reflection. So um, uh, the candle may be on this wall, but the reflection's on this wall, and your robot may see that and actually go to the wall that the candle's not there. So you have to deal with that. You say, well, okay. Again, you not only have to look at the instructions of the competition, but you have to look at all the data sheets, um, which are all the components that you buy. And in the data sheet, it basically says that it gives out a pulse train when it sees uh, a candle or a flame. So you kind of have to set up a test and see, well, okay, I got this candle, and we, I just use a regular, in the competition, they just use a reg, uh-oh, <laughs> that was good. Um, a regular candle. So I got a candle out and started playing with the sensor. And I noticed, obviously, when there's no candle, there's no pulse. Um, and then I turn it on, and you might see some pulses well, once every 100, maybe 75 milliseconds, you'll see a pulse. Well, that turned out to be a um, false positive. And I noticed once I got close enough to the uh, the sensor got close enough, the robot got close enough to the candle, the pulse train started happening about every 10 milliseconds. So then I knew, ah, I've, I've actually found the candle, and I've got a valid um, reading, and I'm not getting a false positive. So, again, you know, we, we look at this and say, hmm, which build a firefighting, but you have to look at all the details, and, and a lot of these problems don't come up until you start actually building and putting the, the robot in the house. Um, the other item now, we, okay, we've determined that the candle is in a particular room. Now we have to determine where in the room is the candle. So we can do that in a number of ways. Um, we could go and actually use the flame detector again, but the flame detector um, is, is just kind of wide open. So it's looking at 360 degrees around. But if you want to pinpoint the flame, you have to only have a slot that's maybe, oh, here we go in inches and millimeters again, or centimeters, uh, just a small little slot. So as the robot seeks, it just picks up the candle. And some people have done that. I haven't, and I've seen it, and it works really well. But then you have to have some way to open it up so it's, it's maybe 180 degrees so it can see the candle in the room, so it can see it quickly. And then you've got to close that little slot up so you're just looking at a particular point in the room. So there's another way we can do it, and that's with pyro detectors. And I started off using this, uh, this one here is an electric tech, and it's, it's, you know, this is it here. The sensor sits back here. It has a cone, and there's a lens here, and this is the device that sits right back here. And it just has four pins. It's got a ground pin, a, a plus pin, and an output pin and a voltage reference. So it's an analog device. So there again, you have to have some way to read that voltage. And that voltage could be a small movement. But it also can detect humans. And in a competition, 
um, in, when we do in robo games, we have lots of people. We might have 30, 40, 50 people standing around the firehouse watching it. And so you have to be real careful that it doesn't detect somebody and see that that may think it's the candle. So you don't have a lot of flexibility. Um, you can go ahead and um, I did once where I designed a circuit that took the analog output, put it into an amplifier, and then put it into a comparator. So I just got an, a, a pulse on and off. And I found out that, boy, I got a lot of false positives with that. So I started looking into a new sensor, which is a thermal array sensor. And this little device right here has eight thermal um, uh, piles in it. And each one kind of gives you a reading of what it sees. And um, it's an infrared. They're arranged in a row. And again, here's where you have to look at the data sheet, because there's the right way and the wrong way to mount it. Um, the viewing angle is actually this way if it's mounted, well, let's see, the, the, the angle is, is this way, so the angle comes out this way, but your candle, the heat goes up, so you want to move it up, so you just rotate it, and you can see in the robot, <coughs> I've got it sitting straight up, so I can detect the heat rising. Um, it measures in Celsius, and it has one other um, um, uh, thermal pile that measures ambient room temperature. And um, I use that in my design of the robot because I look at the ambient room temperature and then I want to see the difference of the uh, what makes the candle flame. When the room is cold, there's usually a big difference between your ambient temperature and what the candle temperature is. But if the room happens to be really warm that the competition is in, there's a small uh, change there. So it makes it a little difficult sometimes to detect it. But I've had really good success with that. And it'll detect uh, a candle up to two meters away. So that's good. It works for the, for the rooms because that's about three feet and the rooms aren't any bigger than that. And here we go, we use I squared C interface. So we kind of use that maybe in our, um, wall following sensors, and so we've got that so it's easy to interface. Now Michael, he uses on his firefighter um, a little different algorithm, and I'm going to let him explain how he does it and looking for the, f uh, for the flame. Well, a pyro detector is a good example of uh, where most people in the firefighting competition use the same hardware. And it's actually how you use that hardware which creates the difference. And there's huge differences in the competition. If you look at the tri Trinity competition itself, people are completing finding the candle, putting the candle out in an inordinately small amount of time. Uh, and the difference is what you actually do with the data. So when I wrote the code to deal with the pyro detector uh, two years ago, my hardware is more or less identical to Bob's. We use exactly the same sensors, uh, but pyro detector, I found I had problems with the ambient temperature. It wasn't consistent. The way that we use the pyro detector is that we measure eight pixels at a time and we scan, and you'll see as the robots put on the floor to put the candle out, uh, we scan eight times. So we create a 64 by 64 pixel field. And within that field, we're looking for the hottest pixels, and that will be the, uh, the candle flame. And that will give you a direction to turn the robot to, drive up to the candle, and put the, f the flame out. I had a problem using the ambient temperature in that it was varying each time uh, I scanned, and I, I found that unable to use. So I used a different algorithm with the pyro, where I actually just calculated an average for the field and then looked for the hottest pixels in the field. And I found that doing something completely different to the way that Bob used the same sensor, I was able to get good success in seeing the candle quickly and getting a good angle to find the candle, drive up to it, and put it out. So. Cool. So, so that th there's no right or wrong way to do anything. Everybody has their own way of doing something, and it just depends on your capability. 
Well, let's move along here. I notice I'm kind of hopefully not talking too long. I'm, I maybe should pick it up here a little bit. Um, so now we've found the candle. We've gone to it. We've used our white line sensor. Uh, we stop. And we, in the rules, it says we can't physically touch the candle. So we need some way to put the candle out without touching it. Well, most of us just use a fan. And here's a little box fan that uh, um, Michael brought over that we tried using. And here's a little bit bigger fan. You can see here I've got a fan on mine. Uh, the only problem was there is that uh, one day it took off, and you'll see it goes fairly fast, and it was going. I put my finger in there and almost lost my finger. So note to Bob, put a fan guard. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a good way to, to put the fan out. Now, there are, there are several other options. And again, if you read the rules, it says if you don't use a fan and use another option, you get a time multiplier. And one of the other options is a CO2 cartridge. And you have to be careful with these because they're just little CO2s. Uh, we use them to fill up uh, bicycle tires or um, 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 uh, paintball uh, guns. But they got about 800 to 1,000 PSI. How do you control that? Well, Michael was doing some testing over in England, and he had his desk. He has robot, candle, stack of papers. So he's got this CO2 cartridge that can put out, in a real force, um, 800 PSI. And he's kind of testing. He opened the valve. All of a sudden, all that came out. It not only put the candle out. Well, it didn't put the candle out. It blew the candle into the stack of papers and started the papers on fire. <laughs> so <laughs> Michael has a problem with that kind of stuff every once in a while. It's an anti-firefighting robot, fire <laughs> creation robot. Yeah, right. So, um, so luckily, he didn't burn down the house or anything, uh, and his wife didn't find out. Um, so that's one way. Till later. <laughs> uh, other ways are water. Uh, you can spray. Um, but with water, the rules say if you do water, you've got to clean up. Other items, I saw one robot use a balloon, and it just had the balloon there. And when it got close enough to the candle, it heated the balloon up, and the balloon popped, and sucked all the oxygen out. Well, the problem with that is you got one time. And if it doesn't put the candle out, you're stuck. And I've seen it where even with fans and stuff, sometimes you need to do it two or three times. And I've also, there was a guy in our club that used um, a candle snuffer. And that's just basically putting um, something over the candle. Well, he was into cameras. And he had, he had two cameras, and he was able to use the two cameras to get close enough to the candle where he had an arm that came down and went right over the candle without touching the candle and put the flame out. It was a really clever idea. So you can get really easy with a, oops, with a, with a fan, or you can maybe get a little bit more complicated with video and, and positioning and trying to figure out all the algorithms. It's just whatever you're comfortable with. And of course, we've got to have some motors and stuff. We use pretty much, uh, it's a Japanese little motor. It's nice. It's inexpensive. We've got some wheel encoders that we put on here. And that helps us with our PID and, and we turning and, and uh, speed and stuff. Makes it really easy to control the robot. And then you've got all these sensors. How do you control them? Well, I, I like building all my boards from scratch. And it's just kind of more fun that way. But every once in a while, I've kind of put the chip in wrong, put the power on, and all of a sudden I get all the smoke. So you have to be careful with that. But you can use, you know, picks, AVRs, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. Or if you're not comfortable or like in England, it's hard to get printed circuit boards made, you can go to a complete robot controller board. This is, happens to be an Arduino board that has a radio on it. It has everything you pretty much need for a firefighter ready to go. Um, this is a, a, a basic uh, X, which is a, a basic interpreter, or uh, there's a basic stamp that we have that's similar, and you could probably use that as well. So again, it's whatever you're comfortable with. And then you need to program it. So we've gone every, through everything, now we need to program it. And that's the problem about robots. <clears throat> there's a lot. There's the electronics, there's the mechanical, and then there's software. And again, not all of us are good at all three. 
And again, that's where you have clubs or you're networking. Um, maybe it can help you out. If you're good at uh, mechanical and electronics, but your software is not too good, you can get somebody to help you or vice versa with any of the others. And I've seen people use, you know, a basic, um, uh, it's like I use PIC, so it would be a, a PIC basic, which is fairly simple. Um, C, Michael uses C. And I also know a guy that writes all his code in assembly language. And he enjoys doing that, so he has real control over it. So that pretty much kind of goes through the whole design and build of the firefighting. You can see here a little bit, I'll just repeat a little bit. So here's the bump sensor. Here are my wall following sensors, and I, I've got one in the back. Here's the Hanamatsu that we talked about, of course, the fan. Here's the pyro that actually sits on the um, uh, a servo that it can rotate. Um, here's the um, Hanamatsu board. And then I've got a little radio down here, which is a little XB uh, um, um, radio that I can send uh, data back to a monitor for testing and stuff. Um, and then, of course, underside of the robot, I've got <coughs> all the motors and batteries and everything else. So it's a pretty compact little guy. Do we, do we have a match? Oh, Angel, you have a match? Oh, excellent. Um, so the, we're going to run this. Okay, why don't you wait two seconds so I'll go through these two videos. Okay, so here was last year's competition. This is my robot, ISIS. Now you can see the rooms. Here's the first room. See, here's the white line. It goes over. Knows now it's in the room. Now it's looking for the candle. Yep, the candle's not in there. You can see the candle's over here. So now it's backed out. Now it changes from, from um, right wall falling to left wall falling, comes around. There's that white line I talked about. It goes in. It searches. Nope, it's not in there. Backs up, hits the wall, turns, then does right wall following around the corner. Again, it's looking for the candle. It's not there. Now, here's a tricky area. I've had lots of problems here. You'll notice that the robot... There's no wall here. So he starts when he gets a little too close to the wall and he does this bobble, but luckily he corrects from it. Comes around the corner. Now you can see the, the candle over here. He's found this wall. Now he's going to look for the white line again. That's the white line detector. Now he's found it. Now he's searching. Ah, there's the candle. He's gone in. Now you can just barely see the um, pyro scanning. And he's scanning. It didn't see it on the first scan, so now it rotates. So he can look, and here's that half circle. Then he'd scanned again, found it, put the candle out. So that was a successful run. Not too bad. Kind of worked. Now, if you look at the rules again, it says that if now I return back to the start, I get extra time for that. So a lot of the guys do that as well. Well, let's take another look at another firefighter. Look at this guy. That's fast. Well, this is an Indonesian team, and they've had four guys, a college students, four years to get this robot to work this fast. Now, he's just lit the candle. Look how fast he goes. Candle's out. Now, he's going to end up, he's going to back up. He's making sure the candle's out. He's going to back up, and sorry about the video got kind of chopped off here. And what he's doing is he's returning back to the start. You notice there's stairs. Now, if you go over the stairs, again, you get a multiplier. So that helps. And he goes back to the start. Well, that's bloody fast. So you have to have consistency, and you have to have fast. Once you, once you get that consistency, then you can build on that speed. Biggest thing is test, test, test. So we're going to... See if we can do a little demo here. Michael's going to get the candle going. Well, he can set his desk on fire. He can't light a candle. <laughs> um, I'll just keep. I'm, I'm going to help him. Huh? Oh, yeah, I think we have a. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I got it. So what we, we're going to do is okay, see if I can get this. We can just heat the bottom up so we don't blow the candle down and start something on fire. And uh, just get the candle lit here. 
Okay, got it. Now I'm going to use the buzzer to start the robot. Michael's going to set him on the floor. <coughs> now this happens to be the same floor that we use in our simulated house. He's going to turn everything on and tell me when it's ready. Ah, worked the first time. Okay, whoops. I got a bit of a problem. Every once in a while, he starts off when he shouldn't. So I'm going to, why don't you start him again, Michael? Sometimes the, micro, the, the uh, microphone on the robot picks up a weird signal and thinks it's the buzzer. We, we have a little communication problem between, I use two uh, picks on this uh, robot, and to start up, there's a little timing between the I squared C. So Michael's going to uh, see if we can get it booted up here. Bear with me in for a minute. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, you can see he's started. He's scanned. He's already found the candle. Now, he's going to make sure that that's the candle and get his bearing on it. He's going to move forward. He's looking for the white half circle. He's found it, and he puts the candle out. And that's it. So we got to build this whole robot just to put the candle out. Okay, so that's a firefighting robot. Really cool. Let's look at another robot called Igor. Igor is an indoor GPS O-Logic robot. That's how we got Igor. And it uses a system, an ultrasonic system, to accurately locate the robot's position in a room. Oh, Peppy's here. <laughs> I have to tell you a story. Um, I was uh, emailing uh, Angel and uh, asking him, what, what do you want to you know, do for a talk? And he said, well, give me some ideas. So I said, well, I could do this, I could do that. Oh, I got this indoor positioning system I could do. And Pepe was co copied on the email. And all Pepe did is he, he, he emailed back and said, Bob, please, 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 please do this. So this is for Pepe. <laughs> um, and it's not all that hard to design and build. So let's take a look at what does it take? Well, we need one ultrasonic beacon. We need two ultrasonic ears or receivers. We need a fast RF radio. And we need some kind of microprocessor. Well, let's look at some facts. We know that ultrasonic travels at 343 meters per second. Well, that works out to be, here we go with the inches again. I forgot to translate that. Um, about 74 microseconds per inch. We use uh, 40 kilohertz. And we know that if we use the time of flight, in other words, the time it takes for the beacon, for the uh, 40 kilohertz, to leave the beacon and get to the ears, that's our time of flight, we divide that by 74 microseconds, and that gives us how long it takes and our distance to get there, because we know 74 microseconds is one inch. And then um, we need to know how long it takes to send the beacon command. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. And then we need to know the distance of our ears. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that. And the key thing, though, in this system is we have to have a controller that has at least two interrupt lines. And you'll see why as we go through this. So what kind of components? Well, we kind of went over them. Here is a beacon. Now, we can use a multiple uh, transducer beacon. This one has up to eight. <laughs> I had to count them. It's that jet lag going. Um, and that's the one I use on Igor. And that gives us a huge distance in a room with lots of power. But let's say you're in a smaller area. You could use, this is a device that I designed to take one of the transducers and it sits right here. This one of these transducers sits right in here and there's this cone. And that bounces out the signal at 360 degrees. But every time I, I bounce it off a, of, of an angle, I lose a little bit of power, and I only have one of them. So it works in a smaller area. 
Then the next thing is we have to have the ears. Here's, here's um, I really wanted to bring this. I had a little demo unit, but I, I just bring so much stuff. Uh, but here's one of the ears, and here's the receiver for the ears. It's in a little box, just a small box, and it runs off a 9-volt battery. But what makes all this work is the RF radio. And I went through lots of RF radios before I found this little XB radio, which is only $20, and it works really well. And we'll see why it works so well here in a minute. So let's look at a block diagram of the beacon. To design a beacon, we need 40 kilohertz oscillator. We need a beacon driver to drive these at about, if you're just using one, you drive them at about 30 volts. Uh, if you're using eight of them, it might be up to 400 volts. So you have to be able to do that. And here is our radio. Now, here's one line that says beacon control. And it goes up uh, to our beacon driver to initiate a ping to send out that 40 kilohertz burst. But our radio also has a serial port that goes to the robot that collects the XY position data. And we'll talk a little bit about how all that works uh, as we go through. Here's the receiver. Um, this when it sits up or on the floor, it's not connected to the robot. And, and this is, unfortunately, uh, you know, I could do just a whole talk, probably an hour, hour and a half, just on the positioning system, because it's, it's a little complicated to see, you know, where the receivers are, where the beacon is. But as we go through this, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to sort that out. So this is that little box. Here's the, uh, here would be one little ear. Here's another little ear. And those are placed a distance apart. So we have a receiver, that's a transducer, an amplifier, and then we run it, the, the pulse. We also um, um, do a, a Schmidt trigger so we get a nice sharp pulse coming out. And we run it into the interrupt of our CPU. And the receiver then, we have our beacon control and our serial data that the receiver, it's kind of weird, it's the receiver, but it's actually sending data to the beacon. When I say receiver, that means it's receiving the 40 kilohertz burst, the signal. Let's look at this little RF radio, this XB, it sits on a Zigbee uh, protocol. And the nice thing about it is it has eight separate data lines that I can go ahead and toggle. So if I set up a transmitter and receiver, and I toggle bit zero on the transmitter side, the receiver side toggles. So I can send just a data bit, which is really handy in what we want to do, because we just need one data bit to initiate the 40 kilohertz burst. But it also has serial in and serial out. And we use that to actually send the XY location to the robot, so the robot then knows where it's at. But we have to determine one thing before we can do that. We have to determine how long it takes for us to send that one beacon control bit. So you set up on a oscilloscope, two channels. Here's a transmitter, here's a receiver. So here's the transmit data. That's that bit zero, say, that we're going to send. So we trigger off the rising edge. And we put the other channel on the receiver. And we look at it um, and see when it goes low. That's the time it takes to send this data bit from this transmitter to this receiver. And it typically in this um, radio is about four to six milliseconds. And you'll see how we. Um, use that in our calculation. Here's our robot. Those are wheels. Here's our ears, our receivers. And in this example, we've got them, again, 48 inches, which is just a little over a meter. And if the robot's in it's sitting in the front of the ears, we've got pretty much an equal pattern. But if the robot's off to the side, this ear is going to receive it before this ear. And that's what we have to detect. And that's why we need the interrupts on our microprocessor. We also um, can use this, and I won't go in detail about how to build it, 
um, but I'll show you it. It's called the Follow Me robot. So you can use the same technology and turn it around to make a Follow Me robot. And I'll explain just a little bit about that uh, as we go. So I talked about the interrupt timing. We need to, in our software, when we send that beacon control pulse, we need to start a timer inside our CPU. And then we're waiting for either one of the interrupts from the ears to receive that pulse. And let's just say the first interrupt receives it. We store that time in a variable. Then we wait for the second interrupt to receive it. We store that. We subtract the two. Now we know how long it took that um, beacon, uh, that uh, 40 kilohertz burst to get to my receivers. And then we just stop the timer in the, in the CPU. Now we got to do a little math. Um, we want to calculate the distance um, between the, the um, we want to know what this distance is. So we calculate that, and that's the distance between the beacon, which is on the robot, to the ears. So we take, that's called uh, the time of flight. So that we want to know that that time, how long does it take that time to get there? Remember, it travels at 74 microseconds per inch. Um, now, we, we measured that our radio transmit time to send that one pulse took about four to six milliseconds. So we subtract the two, divide by 74 microseconds, now we get a distance and we know how far the beacon is from an ear. Now we want to calculate the angle. So we've got the left ear distance, we know the distance between the ears. We got the right ear distance, which is over here, and we calculate the angle in radians. And this is the little um, um, formula to do that. And then we use that then to calculate our actual xy position. We just take the cosine and the sine. And now we know that the robot has an xy position of 10 centimeters by 13 centimeters. Now, this is a relative position. It's not an absolute position. If we do an absolute position, we need to take into account the how high the receivers are off the ground that has more math. But for most part, you don't need that unless you need to know exactly relative to something else uh, where the robot is. So here's Igor. Now Steven, he's just put Igor down in a big room. Igor know, doesn't know where he's at. And the first thing he's going to do, he's going to roam around, he's going to try to get his bearings, and he's looking for the start point, which is way over here in the room that I programmed as the first waypoint. So the cool thing about this is, you know, if you have odometry, if you have wheel slippage, or you pick somebody picks the robot up and puts it down, he's totally lost. That's not the case here. Because we have a, an indoor positioning system, he knows exactly where he's at. So right here is the beacon. Now, you'll notice that the beacon's sitting, he's kind of got a funny neck, and that's kind of why we started to call him Igor, because it was a movie, it was a Young Frankenstein, I think it had an Igor that had a hump, and I kind of thought, hmm, that's kind of cool. And um, so it's a little bit of forward of the robot, because we had it right here, and remember I talked about that fish tailing? Well, we had the same problem with Igor, the fish tail. Now, he's found the start point. So now he knows where he's at. He's, he's found the first start point. Here's a waypoint, and he's going to turn along this waypoint. Now, he's not looking at the tape. He's using the indoor positioning system to find out where he's at. Now, the next waypoint is over here, and he's going to go to that point, and he's turn and the end point that I programmed him is over here. So, you know, this was... Um, uh, a prototype that I built up fairly quickly in a matter of a couple of weeks from start to finish. And we actually used him at CES, it's a consumer electronics show in Las Vegas. And we had the robot here in California, we were in Nevada, and we also added some cameras so we could do uh, telepresence. So the robot we actually controlled uh, from Las Vegas, and we would tell the robot to go to these different points, and the robot would do that. We need to, you know, that's part of the problem with robots nowadays is we don't know where we're at in our environment. And when we can figure that out, that's really handy. Now, if we take that same XY positioning system and we put the beacon 
Stephen here, has a beacon in this vest. See this black vest? He, we got some transmitters in the back, and we have transmitters in the front. Now the receivers are right here. There's two ears. With just a little bit of turning the math around, we now, instead of finding the location where we're at, we just want the robot to always be pointing at Stephen. And we can do that because in, when we look at the math and stuff, we know that if, 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 if one receiver is, uh, takes it longer to receive the other, then we must be at some angle. And we really want the, both receivers to be equal. Then we know we're right in the middle and it follows Stephen. We have, he's just basically turned it off. Now we notice he's stopped about oh, a meter away. Well, we can calculate the distance because we know how to do that. So this is a really um, cool robot in the way that we can um, use it as a service robot. It's hard to see, but there's a little carrier that you could put stuff in it. And when Ted and I first demonstrated it, it was at the Consumer Electronics Show, the Consumer Electronics Show has about 200,000 people. Now, Stephen has a button that he can disable it. He's disabled. Now he's going to turn it back on, and he's going to do a little search, the robot. And this robot's just called Follow Me. And it's found Stephen. It's going to come up right to him. And you notice now Stephen's going to start walking away. And the robot just kind of follows him. So Stephen keeps doing that. So anyway, we're taking the robot to... Um, CES, and we had this huge long hallway, and I'm the old guy, my business partner Ted, he's 20 years younger, but I'm carrying the robot. And um, I asked Ted, now look at this, Stephen stepped over, he, st he still sees that, the robot doesn't get confused, but still follows Stephen. So anyway, we're carrying this robot, and I'm sweating, you know, we got this big long hallway to go down, and I stopped and I looked at Ted and I said, Ted, what are we carrying? He's a robot. Oh, Ted. What are we carrying? It's called follow me. Why am I carrying it? Oh, good point. So I put the vest on, started walking, and the robot just followed me, kept following me through the doorways all the way to our booth. So that was the actual first time we actually got him to actually work in a crowd. So that's kind of a quick, to, for Pepe, kind of a quick introduction into the XY positioning system. Um, what I'd like to do is demonstrate uh, our for Star Wars Force Trainer. Now, you remember I mentioned that we had the mind control robot, and this is the Star Wars Force Trainer. Um, Ted and I were trying to take, what we try and do is we develop all this robotic stuff, and we like to put it in robots, but sometimes we can't. So we've hooked up with different toy companies to try to take some of this technology and put it into cool toys. And one day I was thinking, what if I could take this technology and everybody wants to levitate something? So what if I could levitate a ball? I thought, oh, that'd be really cool. How do I do that? Well, I got a tube and a ping pong ball and actually a fan, and we hooked it up to the, to the headset, and we kind of worked. So that developed out of the... Star Wars Force Trainer that came out last year, 2009. In the United States, it was the, one of the top 10 toys, which we felt really good about that. And uh, Ted and I, we not only came up, I came up with the idea, the concept, but we wrote all the software, we did all the electronics. The only thing we didn't do was the physical um, uh, design of it, and that was, that was uh, controlled by Lucasfilms. And our toy company that we used to market that was called Uncle Milton. So we're going to get Angel up here, and we're going to see if he, how well his concentration is. Mike, does anyone give me a hand to get the headset on and stuff? And uh, we're going to see if we can get Angel to levitate a ball real quick. So let me set some stuff up here. This is probably not going to happen. Well, he's worried no brain that, here. you know, no it's uh, demo time, and it's like a robot, you know. It's not going to work. So what we've got is we've got the headset. The front sensor is actually measuring your EEG wave. So we are truly looking at 
your brain wave. And this guy um, actually looks, you know, let's, yeah, that's good, um, looks at your concentration level. Uh, hang on, Michael, one second. Okay. You just kind of get all the sequence right. Okay, the headset's not quite on. When, when the lights start flashing, the headset's on. So it's not making a good contact. Let me see. Hang on for a sec. I told you, no brain here. <laughs> oh well, it's just an eye. He has two. <laughs> well, let's see. Sometimes when you get. I don't want any joke later <laughs> about <laughs> not having a he brain. He has no brain. Definitely no brain. Do you in a minute, we're going to have to reboot Angel. We did it on a young lady today, and it worked fine. You know? <laughs> hmm. I don't know. Are you still alive? <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm alive, but I don't have a brain. I don't know if I'm thinking. Maybe I'm not let me, thinking. Let me just try it in my picture. I'll play a demo. <laughs> if not, we can get someone else to do it. You did it really good. Él lo ha probado antes y yo prometo que lo he visto funcionar muy bien antes. So this demonstrates I don't have a brain now. Good evening. Can I take your time? Now your Padawan training begins. Ready are you? Begin, you may. So now Bob is concentrating and trying to make the ball move up. It's really tough. It's, 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 a really, it's really not a toy for kids. It's really fun to be able... Oh, sorry. It, it's really not a toy for kids. It's really... Um, take some concentration, and, and there's, there's a training mode that you can do. So, so the whole idea of the toy is we have different levels, one, two, and three. And the idea is when you're becoming a Jedi Knight, there's three different... Um, um, levels that you can go through. So the idea is, is you concentrate until you get the ball in the first level, and you just want to keep it there for 10 seconds. And then you got to move it up to this level and keep it for 10 seconds, and this level. And once you can do that, then you've gone from, say, a, um, what's the first level? Uh, Padawan. Padawan to the second level. <laughs> Jedi Knight. Jedi Knight. And um, then it gets harder, so it takes more concentration. So I just kind of wanted to quickly kind of show that. It's kind of a, a thing, again, that we just came out of the robotics um, to make a toy. So I, I'm, I don't know if this works, but we're going to try to take some quick questions. And don't you go away yet. Um, so does anybody have any questions or anything that um, well, it looks like I'm pretty close to my time uh, that I can answer on anything I talked about or anything? Preguntas. Os las van a traducir, las preguntas que hagáis. O sea, que venga, una, alguna pregunta. Seguro que alguien tiene alguna pregunta. ¿Ninguna pregunta? No, you know, Spaniards, they're sometimes like shy and so on. Hey, veo una. Eh, hola, ¿podría explicar qué sensores tiene el casco ese? Okay, yeah, Angel, he's a good translator. Yes. Ah, okay, you didn't get your headset, that's why. Um, yeah, well, sorry. He asked about the um, sensors you're using in that um, headset. Oh, uh, we didn't develop the actual 
EEG sensor. That was developed by one of our partners. And um, they spent many years on looking at the different um, levels of signal that come out of your EEG wave. So you like have concentration, meditation, uh, drowsiness, uh, anxiety. And so what we did is we said, okay, we want one of your, and they're just ASICs, just little chips, um, to be programmed, the firmware, for concentration. And, and that's what we use. So we re read the EEG wave in concentration, and on the headset, then we've got a radio. Obviously, there's a radio down here. I mean, you can't have a mind control with wires connected to it, because that doesn't look good. Um, and um, uh, on the receiving end of the base station, we just have levels of the EEG signal that comes out. We have another processor, and essentially, it's, it's, just, it's really simple. There's a fan, obviously, that raises the ball, depending on our level. So it was a pretty basic concept, but 10, 15 years ago, we couldn't do this. We couldn't control stuff with our mind. Good, thank you. Más preguntas. <coughs> Otra pregunta más. They're shared at the beginning, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't understand too well uh, how uh, the, the, the ears were put in Igor. Were they on Igor or they were on the room? Ah, the ears were on the room. So the ears would set up, say, at a distance. Okay. And Igor would, would have the beacon down here. So that's why I said it was a little confusing because um, what happens is the ears are re requesting uh, a beacon every 100 milliseconds. So it sends out a signal to the robot to send that 40 kilohertz signal, the ears receive it, the ears do the calculation on the pos robot's position, and then send it back to the robot. Does that answer your question? Yeah, good. Thank you. Más preguntas. Veo que vais animando, poco a poco vais animando y hay más preguntas. ¿Ves? Que no sale. Oops. Mi pregunta es más a, a nivel de la empresa que... A, es a nivel de la, de la empresa que han montado. Eh, quería saber eh, realmente pues al final de, de qué están viviendo porque eh, es una cosa que no, yo por ejemplo me planteo aquí en España montar empresas de, de este estilo eh, puramente tecnológicas y la verdad es que no, no veo campos de aplicación o no sé a qué empresas poder dirigirme por ejemplo el tema de, de juguetes es una cosa que no se me había ocurrido entonces quería saber más o menos de con quién trabajan al final Angel, you got that? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to translate that. That was okay. a very long question. Anyway. Okay. He's wondering how how you get the money, how you how your company works, because uh. here in Spain it's not easy when you have, um, you can have an idea, but it's really difficult sometimes to take your ideas somewhere, like your like your toy companies and so yes. on. And and so he's wondering how, how you do that process. Okay, that's that's a really good question. And when Ted and I started the company, we thought, well, you know, robotics right now is like the PC was 30 years ago. There were a bunch of us guys, and I was one of them, that had like a 4K memory board. And we thought, 4K, what are we going to do with 4K of RAM? That's really cool. And we had, we had computers that we had to do the toggle switches to set the boot address and get it to boot up. And we thought, well, this is really cool. But it was only cool to a group of us. Well, 30 years later, if we go next door, we got close to 2,000 computers just by itself. We got everybody using computers. And robotics is going to be that way uh, maybe in another 20 years. So Ted and I looked at it and we said, well, if we come up with a product, let's just say we did Flexo. And we, we designed it, we put our money into Flexo, and we made a real product out of it. There's a lot of marketing. You know, We have to find somebody to distribute it and do that. We thought, well, what if it fails? We put all our money into one product, we're out of business. So that's why we came up with this idea of many concept, many robots. So we just built something that was more engineering, like this guy and, and our firefighter and, and Igor and Follow Me, and we take them to trade shows. And we just show them at trade shows. And people would come up and say, um, well, what are you selling? 
I said, we're not selling anything. You don't have a product? Nope. Then what are you doing at a trade show? So we explained to them that we're selling concepts and ideas. And our customers would come to us. It's like uh, the Star Wars Force trainer. They saw the robot, and we got talking to them, and they wanted to get a Star Wars line of toys. We said, we can do that for you. So that was a good example of taking, again, just one design that didn't take us a lot of money to do, but then when we found the real company that wanted to turn into a product, they had some of the risk involved. So we started the company with very little money. Um, it took a couple of years of going to a lot of trade shows to kind of get out there, but we've done work for um, Hasbro, for Disney, um, um, and a lot of other uh, big names, and we've got them, all our marketing, it's just Ted and I, that's the company. We hire other consultants as well when we're not good in some area, like analog design, or if we get overloaded and we need another software guy, we bring him in on a, on a, on a, on a consultant basis. So uh, the answer to your question, we just did a lot of different robots designs. We let the people, our clients, pick something and if we had that one and that one and that one, now we have three products out there that we didn't put all our money into, that somebody else is doing a lot of the work, and now we have three opportunities instead of one opportunity to make it big. Good. Más preguntas. Nadie más tiene ninguna pregunta, seguro. Chicos, por aquí, nada. Shy, That's it. I Great. I so. Okay, I, I, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want Angel to come up here for a minute. I really appreciate you taking the time and coming to listen to me, and I hope I wasn't too boring, and I hope you learned something. But could you unwrap that for me? Uh, Angel, no, just unwrap the whole thing. Angel um, is a good ambassador, and he, you know, comes to California, and he talks to robotics, and he's got so much energy and um, everybody likes him. Uh, he um, uh, um, uh, just wants everybody to talk about robots and bring people together. So Ted and I um, decided that we wanted to give him a little award that recognizes his worldwide uh, robotics effort to bring people together, like to bring me here from California, allowing me to talk to you, and he comes to California, and that's what we need is to bring people together. So thank you so much. I have no words. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. This is also for you guys. You guys are here and you guys make this possible. So thank you, everyone. Thank yes, you. and thank no you words. for coming and enjoy the rest of the, the party. Thank you all. Todos los que queráis estar por aquí después. Gracias, gracias. Todos los que queráis ver a Bob, Bob y um, Michael van a estar por aquí esta tarde. Y when are you leaving, Bob? Okay, so uh, va a estar por aquí. Hoy es miércoles y va a estar por aquí mañana, jueves. Lo tendré entretenido con la prensa. Va a estar por ahí paseando con la prensa, tal. Pero bueno, cualquiera que tenga preguntas, le encanta, como habéis visto, hablar de robots, hablar cualquier cosa. Cualquiera que quiera pasarse por el área de robótica, él está siempre por ahí o está haciendo algo. Así que si queréis ver más robots, si queréis ver el Brain Train, el Force Trainer eh, funcionando, que yo se ve que no tengo cerebro y no funciona conmigo, nada más que por eso. Eh, si queréis cualquier cosa, por favor, pasad por el área que os enseñamos más cosas, ¿vale? I just told them they are they are more than welcome to come and see you and ask you questions there in the area. So. You walk around, stop and ask your questions. Okay, thank you. Gracias a todos.
Llévate tu, tus cosas. Gracias. <laughs>